A reading from the first book of Samuel. David spoke to Saul, let your majesty not lose courage. I am at your service to go and fight this Philistine. But Saul answered David, you cannot go up against this Philistine and fight with him, for you are only a youth, while he has been a warrior from his youth. David continued, the Lord who delivered me from the claws of the lion and the bear will also keep me safe from the clutches of this Philistine. Saul answered David, go, the Lord be with you. Then, staff in hand, David selected five smooth stones from the wadi and put them in the pocket of his shepherd's bag. With his sling also ready to hand, he approached the Philistine. With his shield bearer marching before him, the Philistine also advanced closer and closer to David. When he had sized David up and seen that he was youthful and ruddy and handsome in appearance, the Philistine held David in contempt. The Philistine said to David, Am I a dog that you come against me with a staff? Come here to me, and I will leave your flesh for the birds of the air and the beasts of the field. David answered him, You come against me with sword and spear and scimitar, but I come against you in the name of the Lord of hosts, the God of the armies of Israel that you have insulted. Today the Lord shall deliver you into my hand. I will strike you down and cut off your head. This very day I will leave your corpse and the corpses of the whole Philistine army for the birds of the air and the beasts of the field. Thus the whole land shall learn that Israel has a God. All this multitude, too, shall learn that it is not by sword or spear that the Lord saves, for the battle is the Lord's, and he shall deliver you into our hands. The Philistine then moved to meet David at close quarters, while David ran quickly toward the battle line in the direction of the Philistine. David put his hand into the bag and took out a stone, hurled it with the sling, and struck the Philistine on the forehead. The stone embedded itself in his brow, and he fell prostrate on the ground. Thus David overcame the Philistine with sling and stone. He struck the Philistine mortally and, it, and did it without a sword. Then David ran and stood over him. With the Philistine's own sword, which he drew from its sheath, he dispatched him and cut off his head. Verbum Domini. Blessed be the Lord, my rock. Blessed be the Lord, my rock, who trains my hands for battle, my fingers for war. My refuge and fortress my stronghold, my deliverer, my shield in whom I trust, who subdues my people under me. Blessed, Blessed be the Lord, my rock. O God, I will sing a new song to you. With a ten-stringed lyre, I will chant your praise. You who give victory to kings and deliver David, your servant, from the evil sword. Blessed, Blessed be the Lord, my rock. Oh, 
Christus vobiscum. Et cum spiritut tuo. Lectio Sancti Evangelii secundum Marcum. Gloria tibi et homine. Jesus entered the synagogue. There was a man there who had a withered hand. They watched Jesus closely to see if he would cure him on the Sabbath so that they might accuse him. He said to the man with a withered hand, come up here before us. Then he said to the Pharisees, is it lawful to do good on the Sabbath rather than to do evil, to save life rather than to destroy it? But they remained silent looking around them at anger and grieved at their hardness of heart, Jesus said to the man, stretch out your hand. He stretched it out and his hand was restored. The Pharisees went out and immediately took counsel with the Herodians against him to put him to death. Verbum Domini The Gospel account of the healing of the man with the withered hand shows us that Jesus Christ came to fulfill and perfect the law. Having a day of rest and worship on the Sabbath was the outward expression of the Jews' covenant with God. It reminded them of their trust and their total dependence that man must have in God. And this man's withered hand in the gospel symbolizes man's relationship with the creator after the original sin. It was lifeless, it was sterile and dry. And because the Pharisees had grown so embittered, their observance of a law was at best the keeping of their own external precepts. The way in which they kept the law did not change their hearts. They were waiting for Jesus to break the Pharisaical law in just the, slight, the slightest little minute way. At this point in Jesus' public ministry, these Pharisees must have heard of Jesus' miracles before, performed by him. And by performing a miracle on the Sabbath, Jesus is making a distinction between servile work and good deeds done out of compassion and mercy. The anger and grief that Jesus expressed was because of sheer injustice or evil. Yes, anger can be just or righteous in the face of injustice or evil. As the God-man, the anger that Jesus would have experienced clearly would have been the most temperate and virtuous expression of anger ever seen or recorded. We have to remember that the God-man, Jesus Christ, was free from original sin. He was free, totally free, of any personal sin and free of any concupiscence or the effects due to sin. And any anger or grief that Jesus experienced would not have been tainted the least little bit by selfishness, or self-centeredness. And it's difficult for us who have inherited original sin to imagine this. To imagine an anger and a grief that is totally not about self. 
self-centeredness or narcissism. Jesus, again, had no sin at all, no original sin. So his anger that he experienced, that he expressed, would have been totally temperate, totally virtuous. And it's hard for us to get our minds around this, but it's good to talk about every now and then because we do hear a few times in the gospel that Jesus expressed anger. And it's good to kind of imagine what that would look like. It is clear that Jesus' anger and grief led him to even greater mercy and even greater compassion with this man with the withered hand. And this is an act of mercy. This is what mercy looks like. God reaching out to us. And also in the gospel, the man with the withered hand reaching out to Jesus. Mankind's brokenness and sin reaching out to God. This is what mercy is. Mercy is what love looks like when turned toward the sinner, when turned toward the downcast, when turned toward the broken, the weak. A better translation of withered hand would be dry hand. In the Greek, it means dry hand. There was no blood flowing through this man's hand. It was lifeless. It could be compared to a branch being cut off from the vine. Once a branch is cut off from the vine, the sap, the life-giving sap, cannot flow through the branch in order to keep that branch alive, in order to keep the fruit or the leaves on that branch alive. Once it's been severed, that life-giving sap can't reach it. And once cut off from the life-giving sap, from the vine, it's unable to be communicated to the dead branch. And after time, that branch shrivels up and dies. And this could be used as an analogy for our fallen state after original sin. There was a barrier between man and God. And cut off from God, just as a branch is cut off from a vine, man is spiritually dead without God. There's a barrier. In all his public miracles and healings, Jesus is directing us not merely to physical healing, but to reconciliation with God, with spiritual healing. All throughout the Gospels, there are many physical healings. There are many restorations to health. But note in all of these restorations to health, Jesus also is talking about more clearly what he wants to happen interiorly is this spiritual healing, is this reconciliation with God. And the physical healing is really a sign of what has happened interiorly, of our union with God, of our reconciliation with God when we repent, when man reaches out to God in faith, to repent. He's not only restored interiorly, that, that, that we can't see that. We, we can't see what happened in this man with the withered hand, his act of repentance, his reaching out to God. That's unseen. What's seen is the miracle, the external sign that happened that Jesus healed this man. Sacred scripture is clear that God in assuming human nature, 
He assumed our transgressions, bore our grief, carried our sorrows and infirmities. Theologians and spiritual writers have said that the God-man assumed to himself every human suffering. And it can be speculated that as the God-man, Jesus felt what this man with the withered hand experienced. This is something that we should try and wrap our minds around, that we should pray about, that Jesus Christ knows who you are. Sometimes, perhaps, in the midst of our pain, in the midst of suffering, in the midst of anguish, the great temptation isn't it to think that God doesn't know what I'm going through, that God doesn't know my pain, that he's somehow so far away that he somehow doesn't identify with me. That's not the God that we worship in Jesus Christ as the second person, God the Son. As God the Son, he knew, Blessed Newman would even say that he knew in his passion what you and I go through. Every anguish, every sorrow, every pain, every joy, every happiness that we've ever experienced, the God-man himself experienced. And this is because he is the one, the mediator between God and man, the mediator who reconciles us to God. Only he could experience this. It's hard for us to wrap our minds around this, how one man can experience and assume to himself all of the sin of mankind, the guilt, the consequences due to sin, how he can know each one of us. But as God, as the God-man, this is what the gospel truth is. That he knows you. Just like he saw that man with the withered hand. And that man with the withered hand reached out to him. He knows your suffering and pain. Probably better than you do. And it's important for us, whenever we fall into the temptation that God doesn't understand, and all of us have been there, I think. All of us have questioned. Questioning is not a bad thing. G.K. Chesterton says, a thousand questions are better than one doubt. Questions have answers. All of us have been at the point where we cry out to God, do you understand? Do you know what I'm going through? And he does. In this gospel passage, we see the state of fallen humanity, withered, dry, reaching out to God. We may not have withered hands, so to speak, but each of us needs to hear these same words from Jesus, perhaps. Maybe our souls are a little bit withered after time. Maybe we need to get to confession, those who are listening, perhaps. Maybe it's been a long time since you've made a good confession. Maybe something is really burdening you on your soul that you need to let go of. That's kind of like choking you. That's Use this analogy. Think of that man with the withered hand. Think of that man whose hand was lifeless and dry. 
And when he reached out to Jesus, Jesus completely restored his hand. But not only restored his hand, his withered hand, but restored him interiorly. Cleansed him of his sin. That's the real healing. That's the real healing that Jesus wants to give us. And he wants us to stretch out our hands. And it's only when we stretch out our lives, really, and when our lives come into the divine radius of Jesus Christ, close to him, is when we are healed. And this happens primarily when we come to him in the sacraments. All the sacraments, really. Especially the Most Holy Eucharist and the Sacrament of Penance. They're both connected to one another. Jesus will bring about our restoration. And this healing will take place. Maybe not a physical healing. Sometimes physical healings take place. But most of all, an interior healing. Maybe other people won't know it, but you will know it. You will experience true liberation, true freedom, when Jesus touches the inmost parts of your soul, when we reach out to him. He stretched it out, and his hand was restored.